uh, spent some time yesterday, of course, talking about the, the process of the judgment seat of Christ. And so I just want to iterate uh, one or two of the things that we finished with uh, yesterday, because I'm going to go a bit deeper into one or two of those contexts in relation not to the process of judgment so much, but the principles that will govern the judgment seat of Christ. You know, it's one thing to know what is going to happen, and, and there's a lot revealed about that, of course, in the Word of God. Uh, and we can go in with our eyes wide open as to what we can expect. It's another thing to think about the principles that will govern the decisions that will result in our destiny. So we need, we need to look at that aspect of it a little bit uh, deeper today than we did yesterday. So it's not going to be hopefully a long session. It could be a long session because there are many, many scriptures we could use. We could use, for example, Judges chapter 7. I'll watch the time and if there's any time we might duck into Judges 7. But we're just going to use mainly New Testament passages this morning. So let's just remind ourselves of where we were yesterday. The process of judgment. The angels raising the dead. Contemporary groups before Christ's judgment throne. Beginning with the final generation and working back to Adam. And we saw that was the, the, the key message of Matthew chapter 20 and the parable of the vineyard. That those of us who come last in the scheme of things will actually make our appearance before Christ first. And he will work from us back uh, to Adam. The point I want to make arising out of that, uh, brethren, sisters and young people, is that the point of the judgment seat is not just to determine our destiny. The point of the judgment seat is to uphold the righteousness of God. You know, I'm some, sometimes asked the question, well, why does it have to be a judgment process anyway? Doesn't God know? Doesn't Christ know where we stand in the scheme of things? Wouldn't it be just easy for him to wave to left and right? I mean, that would take the pain away, wouldn't it? Well, yes, it would take the pain away, but it would not achieve one thing that has to be achieved at the judgment seat of Christ. And that is the vindication of of the righteousness of God. Now the judgments that are going to fall upon humanity generally are really all about that. They're not just to sweep away the wicked. They'll do that. But they are to vindicate the righteousness of God. I want to demonstrate that to you because I'm going to take you very briefly to... You don't have to get turn it up because we saw this yesterday. This is Romans 14, remember, verses 10 to 12, where we saw very plainly that even though we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul's not using that phraseology here. This word Christ should be theos, and what follows proves that, as we saw. So what does he mean when he says we shall appear or all stand before the judgment seat of God? Well, the next two verses explain it. It will be the angels, the representatives of deity, that will do the interviewing. <coughs> They're the ones to whom we're going to have to open our mouth and fully confess as this word here means in the red, confess, right? They're the ones that will do the interviewing. And we will have to give an exposition, as this word here, account means, logos, the word spoken, an expression of the thoughts of the mind, an account or an exposition. As we pointed out, Christ cannot, he doesn't have the time to interview everyone individually and personally. And so it will be the angels who do that task. So that, that being the given... What's the point of it? What's this going to achieve? Now you'll notice, as we pointed out, that Paul's actually quoting from the Old Testament. And I'd like you to turn up Isaiah 45 with me, please. You want to see what Isaiah 45 says, because he actually quotes it again in the New Testament. And we're going to see that it tells us something about the judgment process. So let's have a look at Isaiah 45 and the end of the chapter. <coughs> Now, I want to read from verse 22 because this actually embraces us. It talks about Yahweh being a just ale and a saviour uh, in the previous verse, verse 21. And then we read in verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Now that means the lands of the Gentiles. All the ends of the earth. And here we are. We're in that position right now as recipients of the blessings of the truth. He goes on to say, For I am ale, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, in righteousness. See this? It's gone out of his mouth, in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Now that last 
part of the verse is what Paul quotes. For it is written, as I live, saith Yahweh, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. And Paul's explanation of that is, so then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Right? And his representatives on that occasion will be the angels. It's to them that we will speak. The, the angel has kept the record of our life, that's had the task of supervision as best as he can do, depending on our willingness uh, to be guided. All right? So that's why Paul speaks this language here in Romans chapter 14. So what's the point of this? Well, let's just read on in Isaiah 45. Surely shall one say, this is verse 24, in Yahweh have I righteousness and strength. Not in their own righteousness. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. So those who set their heart against God are going to be ashamed. Why are they going to be ashamed when they do this? When the angel takes out the record and goes through the record and says, Now listen, on such and such a day you did this, and the next day you did this, and the following day you did this. You turned your back on God, you did all the things that you knew you shouldn't do, and you knew you were doing wrong, and you didn't repent. And that's what's in this record. They will be ashamed. And so the, the judgment process is going to be very humbling for those who have taken their own course in life, who thought they could achieve this for themselves, who thought they could do it their own way. All right, it's going to be very, very humbling. This is all about the declaration of the righteousness of God. That's what the judgment seat's about. To declare that he is righteous. I have sworn by myself, he says, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. And he's not going to advocate that for any man. He goes on to say this in verse 25. In Yahweh shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. All right? So I think you can see the point of that. Now I want you to come to Philippians chapter 2. Because you see, Philippians, in Philippians, Paul actually quotes the same passage from Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 23. What's it about? Well, it's about Christ being charged with vindicating his Father's righteousness. That's what it's about. So let's read this section from Philippians 2. We won't read the whole section. I think you're, you're familiar with the, ver the, the preceding verses up to verse 9, how he's given a name, a highly exalted name, etc. <clears throat> verse 10 says, now, where's this coming from? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul is actually using Isaiah 45 and verse 23 again. He's not just quoting it, he's explaining it. He's telling us what it really means. So when the angels have done their job, we go before the one who represents the Father and his specific role is to uphold the righteousness of God. So there will be no compromise. If the record shows that we have been unrepentant, we want to do things our own way, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, because he uses sheep and goats to represent the two classes of the judgment seat. All right? If that's what we've done, the record will show that, we will be ashamed before the angel, and then dismissed to the left. It's as simple as that. I mean, you don't have to be Einstein to work that out, do you? And it's all about upholding the righteousness of God. That's why you have to appear there, brothers and sisters. That's why you won't get the easy road. You won't get the painless path of some desire. It's not going to happen. Because God has to be vindicated. And if you have, if you have responded to the truth in your life, you've endeavoured to do the right thing, you've repented when you've failed, and we often fail, and you seek to get back on the path and you've got your direction right, you have no reason to fear the judgment. The record will be clean. You'll be blameless. You're not going to be ashamed like those who are in the opposite camp. All right? That's, it's pretty simple stuff, isn't it, really? But it's very, very important. 
So more time is likely to be spent with the rejected by the angels for this purpose. So where people have a bad record, the angel's got a bigger job, hasn't he? He's got to go through this record, which has got all of these failings and things that have happened. And you'll be stepped through that, piece by piece. You know what Jesus said? What you do in the closets shall be published upon the housetops. All right? That's going to happen when the angels interview, and it becomes known in your quarter, standing before Mount Horeb, what the angels talk to you about. It will become public. Even the righteous will be greatly humbled by the experience. As we said yesterday, Peter says, the righteous will scarcely be saved because it will take, won't it, divine mercy, grace, for any of us to be taken to the right hand. And so Nehemiah, who was conscious of his own failings, dedicated man that he was, a man of prayer and action, kept on saying right throughout the book of Nehemiah, you're familiar with the words, aren't you? Oh, Yahweh. Remember me for good. So when at, the, in, when at night we, we look back upon the day, brothers and sisters, and we, we recognise some, some failings, and maybe don't even recognise failings, and we acknowledge that we are weak creatures and that we have fallen short, that we have missed the mark, and we seek the Father's forgiveness, don't forget the other part. Nehemiah didn't forget the other part. Please, blot out my transgressions. But remember me for good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, is there? Remember me for good, he said. Because if you have endeavoured to do good, that's recorded, isn't it? It's been recorded by the angel. And that's not going to be blotted out. <coughs> Only the sins are blotted out of the record. If you've sought forgiveness for them. So that the end of this process is that no flesh will glory in God's presence. No flesh. The rejected, the accepted, doesn't matter who you are. No flesh will glory. The righteousness of God will be seen to be upheld. And it will start with us. Peter says judgment must begin at the house of God. So what about this process that, that shows the principles? I want you to come back to Matthew 25 with me. Now we, we were here yesterday, but we were here mainly for... A picture of the judgment seat. I want to make a few comments about this because I'm fully aware of what Brother Thomas says in Eureka about this. And I'm often, you know, approached and don't you recognise what Brother Thomas said? Well, yeah, I do. Just don't happen to agree with him on this particular matter and I'll show you why. There's not much I don't agree with Brother Thomas on, but if the scripture demands that I do, I have to dis disagree. I don't have any choice, do I? So... <coughs> Christ simply separates sheep from goats. And we saw this record in Matthew 25, and verse 31 through 34. All he does is he waves to the right and the left, respectively. Verse 32 says that. Before him shall be gathered representatives of all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So here you've got the picture of a shepherd. All he's doing is pushing or waving to one side or the other. Here. You're a goat, that way. You're a sheep, this way. So Christ will be sitting upon a throne. We'll be brought before him in contemporary groups so our brethren will know what the outcome's going to be. Well, they'll see the outcome, all right? And all he will do is look at that person who steps up, smile if they're going to go to the right, and wave them to the right. Great pleasure, joy in that for him and for them. But some... Far too many, because, see, there's, there's a suggestion from this verse that the goats are actually more numerous than the sheep. I mean, what do you do if you have a hundred goats and five sheep? Do you separate the goats from the sheep? Or do you separate the sheep from the goats? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? Why go to all the labour of picking out a hundred goats when you've only got five sheep? You pick out the five sheep, don't you? There's a strong suggestion in that, that sadly, there's more goats than sheep. And we want to talk about this because, you see, we choose. It's not that God set a number, this many people will be saved, and the, the, sorry about the rest. We actually determine our destiny by choosing to be a sheep or a goat. Now, some people think, oh, that's just too simplistic, Lord. Come on. 
Now be serious. Be a bit more profound than that. Why, why sheep and goats? I mean, that's, that's child stuff. No, it's not, as you're going to see. He's very deliberate in choosing sheep and goats because it's all about character. And that's what's going to determine our destiny. Character. What character are you? Are you a sheep or are you a goat? And we'll get to that in a minute. Some object, of course, as we said yesterday, when they are their way to the left, they object. They claim better treatment. And all the Lord does is give them the one line answer of Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I don't even know who you are. But Lord, we were on the ecclesial list. My name is on the ecclesial list. <coughs> Sorry, I don't know who you are. Oh, how would you feel? All right. When all have appeared, Christ glorifies the righteous simultaneously. And we read this in Matthew 25 and verse 34. He set the sheep, verse 33, on the right hand, the goats on the left. Then, notice this, then the king shall say to them on his right hand. Now this is before those on the left are removed. Now if you and I were doing this, we'd say, well let's get rid of this mob over here. Let's get rid of them first. Okay? And then we'll glorify the righteous on the right hand. Wouldn't you do it that way? No. Wouldn't that be more comfortable? Yes. But it's not going to be done that way. Those over there, crying, gnashing teeth, weeping, on the left, are going to stand there and watch those on the right glorified together in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, can you imagine if you happen to be on the right amongst this vast company, can you imagine those who are on the right hand standing there when their nature is changed, standing there saying, well, that was a nice sensation. <laughs> or can you think that it would be quite different? I think it's going to be quite different. They will be bouncing around uh, in joy. Can you imagine being made immortal and the response that that's going to produce? There's all this rejoicing over there, but on the other side, all you can hear is weeping and teeth gnashing. And the next thing is the angels push away, herd away the multitude on the left. What a picture that is. All right? One of the angels' last works, apart from educating the saints in the things that they will have to do in the millennial age, and especially in the 40 years of judgment that will follow Armageddon, <coughs> Is to, is to herd the rejected away. Very unpleasant task. Because you see, many of those people will have been overshadowed by some of those angels and it will be a disaster, a tragedy, to have to do that job. I want you to come to 2 Corinthians 5, this is 10 to 11. Now we'll come back in a minute to the sheep and goats matter. But having just talked briefly about a change of nature, let's just see how Paul comments on that in 2 Corinthians 5. This is 10 and 11 we want. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, of course, Paul. We all know that we're going to make an appearance, if we're responsible, before the judgment seat of Christ. He's not saying that. Paul is not saying that. As you can see, this word appear in yellow and the word made manifest, they're actually the same Greek word. It's the Greek word phanaru. But the translators, for whatever reason, have chosen to render it differently in verse 11 to the way they render it in verse 10. It's exactly the same Greek word. It means to make apparent or to show forth. So when they translated it made manifest, that is very close to the meaning of this Greek word. So why don't we use the same translation in verse 11? And we should. And this is what Paul is saying. For we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ. That's what it's about. To reveal who we are. He goes on to explain that. That everyone may receive the things, and the word done in italics, cross it out, the things in body. Now that word in there in the Greek is dia. And we use dia, diaphragm, diagram, etc. 
Dia means through. And this course is saying that the reward is seen in what happens in the body. He will receive the things through the body. If you're sown to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption, end up on the left hand. If you're sown to the spirit, you shall of the spirit reap life everlasting, end up on the right hand. You get in body the consequences of the choices you've made in life. According to that he hath done, whether good or bad. So Paul says in verse 11, Knowing therefore the phobos, the phobia, the terror of the Lord, you don't want to mess around with this God, we persuade me. But he says, you know our character, you know our way of life, we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Now we're going to see in fact that some of, some of these Corinthians didn't highly regard Paul's motivation, which is why we read a little while ago from 1 Corinthians 4. They actually questioned Paul's motivation. But he's saying here that his life was open before God. What Paul did in private is what they saw him do in public. What they saw him do in public is what he did in private. Hands up those who are perfectly consistent in public and private. Anybody? Anybody bold enough? Well, I won't put my hand up either. <laughs> Because we all know our folks, don't we? But Paul could say, what you see publicly is what I practice privately. And when you get to that stage of life, you know you're fully committed. All right? So I want you to come back now to Matthew 24, 25. I want to talk about sheep and goats. So let's deal with this matter of of the parable of the sheep and goats, which, as I said, in Eureka, Brother Thomas presents this as being the national judgment of the nations. Now, there is, there is going to be a national judgment of the nations in which we, the saints, will be involved. And that's all spelled out in Daniel chapter 7. Yeah, there is going to be a national judgment, but this passage is not talking about that. Or you, you might apply the principle of sheep and goats to the character of the nations, but that, this parable is not about that national judgment. And he recognises that, in fact, in Eureka itself. You see, this address, Matthew 24, 25, is actually one discourse. And we know that from chapter 26 and verse 1. Because chapter 26, verse 1, it says this. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, when he had finished all these sayings. So that means that when he began to speak, back in chapter 24... Verse 3, he was asked a question, and he responds from verse 4 onwards. Right to the end of Matthew 25 is one address, one speech, okay? Very important to remember that. Because, you see, there are three parables in Matthew 25 that actually expand upon what he was saying in Matthew 24. So have a look with me at Matthew 24 and verse 45, where he says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Now, some of you will be aware that the word household there is the Greek word therapia. We get the English word therapy from it. So what is the ecclesia, brothers and sisters? Is it a prison? No. It's a hospital. <laughs> Isn't it? It's a place of spiritual therapy. Now I know some ecclesias that are not places of spiritual therapy. And that's sad. Because that's what the ecclesia ought to be. It ought to be a place where you can come knowing that you're going to receive spiritual therapy. And you should expect that in this place of spiritual therapy there will be faithful stewards Stewardship. People who do what says at the end of verse 45, who give them their food in due season. And they do that with an open hand. Not the clenched fist of verse 51. Of verse 50 and 51. Sorry, verse 48 to 51. Where he talks about the man who, who clenches his fist and beats and smites his fellow servants. Which sometimes happens in the ecclesia. And it shouldn't happen. So here we've got the Lord talking about faithfulness and wisdom that leads to good stewardship. And that's what the three parables that follow are all about. 
So when you come to chapter 25, verses 1 to 13, you have the parable, the well-known parable of the five wise and the, and the five foolish virgins, the ten virgins. Now I'm not going to go into that parable, I don't need to, you know it. But you see, what's it about? Four times you read the word in that parable, wise. You read it in verse 2. Five of them were wise. In verse 4, but the wise took oil. In verse 8, and the foolish said unto the wise. Verse 9, but the wise answered. Why four, do you think? Why four times? Well, four just happens to be the scriptural number for righteousness and God manifestation. That's why the most holy is a perfect cube. That's why the camp of Israel set out in a four square in camp. You can go on and on. Four is the biblical number for righteousness and God manifestation. So the Lord is expanding upon verse 45 of Matthew 24. And he does the same in the parable of the talents, the one that follows from verse 14 uh, through verse 30. Because you see, four times in the parable of the talents, he uses the word faithful. And you find that in verse 21 and in verse 23. Twice in 21, twice in 23. It's probably not a bad idea to have those highlighted. And to have a little note to look back at chapter 24, verse 45. Because he's actually expanding upon who is then a faithful and wise steward. So what do you reckon the third parable is going to be about? National judgment? No. It's going to be about stewardship. It's going to be about outcomes. All right? The results of people operating in the ecclesia. Is it a place of therapy? Are they giving to their master's servants their meat? Spiritual meat in due season? That's the question being asked. And here's the outcome. So that's why this is a picture of the judgment seat of Christ. So it's all about that, brothers and sisters. Brother Thomas even recognises that in Eureka. And here are some passages, volume 5, page 43, and page 82. Volume 1, page 219. Volume 2, page 254. He recognises that the primary role of this parable is in fact about our personal judgement. So what about it? Well, we looked at this passage yesterday. I'm not going to go back into all the detail there. We are going to look a bit more closely at this. Now we pointed out these characteristics yesterday of sheep and goats. So the Lord is dividing at the judgment seat among the responsible between sheep and goats. He's extracting the sheep from the more multitudinous goats. So what does he mean? Well we saw these characteristics, didn't we? Sheep are dependent creatures whereas goats are independent. Sheep are submissive, goats are rebellious. Sheep are willing, goats callous, uncaring. Sheep obedient, goats disobedient. Sheep gregarious, they love being with their fellow sheep. Goats love being alone. They're solitary creatures. Sheep are normally white in the Middle East and goats were normally black. So even their covering provides a hint. And most importantly, brothers and sisters and young people, the characteristic of sheep, and this is being seriously tested in these final days of our probation, seriously tested by internet, by all the communication methods that we are now have made part of our lives, we are being seriously tested as to whether we are sheep or goats. Because sheep will only eat that which the shepherd leads them to. To the grass beside the still wood. Do I need to quote Psalm 23? No. All right. The sheep will eat what the shepherd leads them to. But goats will eat anything. You have goats, do not leave your clothing out on a line drying. Do not leave your boots at the back door. They will chew on leather. They will chew on tin cans. They will try anything. Got the message? I think it's pretty plain, isn't it? So what about the characteristics of sheep and goats? Well, these are the biblical characteristics of sheep. They're attentive. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. They're willingly led. Psalm 23, verse 2. 
He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. They want to be led and they want to eat what the shepherd leads them to. They're submissive, Isaiah 53 verse 7. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. They don't argue with God. Thy will be done, not mine. And that's the character of a sheep. When the Lord appeared before Pilate, he didn't open his mouth. That's the character that he wants to see in us. But they do occasionally stray, don't they? Isaiah 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And that's why, of course, forgiveness is there. When there's acknowledgement and a desire to turn back to the right way, forgiveness is there. And it comes out of the record. So that's sheep. And we could go on for quite some time about sheep, couldn't we? But I really think we need to focus a bit more on goats. Because we don't want to be in this class, do we? Now, I want you to notice something. You do not read in Matthew 25 that there's, there's a creature in between a sheep and a goat. You do not read about a sheoat, all right? A half a sheep and half a goat. There is no such creature. There is no third way. You're either a sheep at the judgment seat or you're a goat. And we make the choice. It's not made for us. We make that choice. Now, I'm going to quote to you from the writings of goat keepers. Now, if anybody going to know about the characteristics of goats, it's people who keep goats. We have any goat keepers here in this hall? No. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. Anyway. <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to look at the writings of goat keepers. So what are the characteristics of goats? Unlike sheep who graze... Goats feed on the leaves and shoots of shrubs, killing them, a habit that enables them to thrive in semi-arid scrublands and mountains. You see, they can be, they're self-reliant. They don't care what they eat. This means they can be out there alone. Goats are cap capricious. They are impulsive and unpredictable, devious and contrary. I see Gil, he's, he's nodding his head and laughing, so he knows this is true. <laughs> if they are not poking their heads through fences, see, they don't like fences, they don't like restrictions. They may be standing on their hind legs, stretching for those tender leaves just out of reach. Goats are never content with what they have. You begin to see why the Lord is choosing the characteristics of goats. Do you know anybody like this? You know anyone like this? I'm not talking about in the truth. Do you know anyone like this? Stan says, no, there's nobody like that. <laughs> right? Never come across them. Now, this is from a long-time goat farmer. Violence and herd order was the heading of this particular paragraph. No matter how you want them to always get along, Chris Delphine should really get along, there will be occasions where your goats fight and take pot shots at each other. Now that never happens in our community. Does it? <laughs> the best thing to do is to let them fight it out. It's brutal, but it is the way of goats. It is their nature. <laughs> You may also see other goats get involved and take sides in a fight. Now, that, I've never seen that happen. <laughs> goats will ram lesser goats for no other reason than just to make sure they know their place. Get out of my way. I'm superior. I'm senior to you. <laughs> goats hate restriction. Now, goats are intelligent and playful, but they're impulsive unpredictable and devious. They are experts in opening gates and squeezing through small gaps because they hate to be confined. Don't you put any ecclesial rules around me. Fences that will handle sheep, cattle and horses will not hold goats. They will work tirelessly to spring themselves from any situation 
they deem inhibiting. Goats do not push well. If you push them to get them out of your way, they will lean into the push. <laughs> We're talking about human nature here, aren't we? Yeah. That's why Christ chooses sheep and goats. Because the goats are people who have not responded to the truth as they should. All right? The truth hasn't been working in their lives. It hasn't been shaping their attitudes and their characters. That's the problem. Goats are not good followers. Consequently, goats are not very good followers. Gregarious behaviour means they love company is a term that refers to the flocking or herding instinct which is found strongly in sheep, cattle and horses. Again, this quality is rather weak in goats. They prefer leading or going off on their own. Meat packers use this instinct in sheep and goats to their advantage. They will train an old goat, appropriately called a Judas, to lead sheep to the pens for slaughter. A well-trained Judas will lead group after group of sheep to the slaughter all day long. Never gets his own head cut off. So I ask the question, brothers and sisters, how are we going? And most of us probably say, well, you know, I'm, I'm really endeavouring to be a sheep and I want to be a sheep. But most of us will see that every now and then, when human nature gets the better of us, we're goats. Alright? So we probably need to think about that. It's simple. Children can understand this, can't they? It's simple, but the things that are most important are often the most simple. Let's have a look at Matthew 25. I want to see what the outcome is here. Matthew 25, and let's have a look at verse uh, 34 again, where he says, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. That's stewardship, isn't it? I was hungry, and you gave me meat. That's, that's chapter 24, verse 45. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with doing any of those things literally. And people do those things. But Christ is not emphasising the literal. He's not emphasising the Salvation Army approach to this. You know, we have a, do you have a Salvation Army in this country? You know, these guys who dress up, and men and women dress up, and you know, look like soldiers, you know, military caps on. They know nothing about doctrine, most of them. Now they're just they're what's called do-gooders. Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing good to all men. We're commanded to do that. But that's all they do. It's not going to lead anywhere. It will not lead anywhere, either for them or the people that they support. It's only a temporary thing. They're not healing the problem. The problem is the problem of human nature. And the only way that that can be healed is the truth. All right? To be in the truth. And they don't offer truth. So what, what is Christ saying here? Well, there's this quotation you can see in 1 John 4, 17. See, they respond. These people on the right hand respond this way. Verse 37. Then shall a right, righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungry and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger or naked and clothed thee? When did we see you sick or in prison and came to thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it, unto the one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And so John picks this up and he says, You can have confidence at the judgment seat, he says, if you have endeavoured to be like Christ. Because he says, because as he is, so are we in this world. We are trying to be like Christ. But you see, verses 35 to 36 refer to kindnesses that are only those that the Lord could fittingly identify with. And Brother Carter says this, To feed a sick soul may have greater value than feeding a hungry body. 
To help the spiritually weary may fill a greater need than restoring physical vigour. Now Christ could not say, could he? He certainly will not say at the judgment seat when he turns to those on the right. He will not say, well when you saw me spiritually weak and spiritually naked, you came and supported me and gave me a covering. Because he was never spiritually weak. Christ was never, like you and me, spiritually naked. Was he? He wasn't spiritually hungry either. Because his father woke him up every morning and spoke in his ear. Isaiah 50, verse 4. See? He was never thirsty spiritually because he always turned to the word of God. So he couldn't say that, could he? He has to lower it to the practical. To the things that he was. Because there were times when he was hungry. Physically hungry. And physically thirsty. And physically naked, so to speak. And did need the support of others. Right? So we've got to raise this to a higher level. Because the real value is in helping people spiritually who are in prison. Helping people spiritually who are naked. That's a far greater work because it actually leads somewhere permanent. Verses 40 and 45 provide a contrast. I don't know whether you've noticed this. But you see I read verse 40. It says this. When Christ is talking to those on his right hand, the righteous, the accepted, who are now immortalized, and they're asking him, well, Lord, when did we see this? Well, when you did it unto me, you did it unto the least of these. He's, he's looking at those on the right. Unto the least of these, my brethren. But it's not like that in verse 45. Because when he deals with those on the left, he asks the same, well, they ask the same question. Well, when saw we? Replies the same way. When you did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it not to me. He drops out some words. Do you notice what they are? Verse 45. Then shall he answer them, saying, this is the ones on the left, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, Where's the words, my brethren? Weren't many of these people on the ecclesial rolls as Christadelphians, brethren of Christ? Well, yes. But he doesn't call them his brethren. Because they're not his brethren anymore. They might have been on the ecclesial roll. That's why he says, Depart from me, ye workers of the... I don't even know who you are. You might have been on the arranging board. You might have been a speaker. But if you're on that left hand, you're not his brother. Now that's pretty... It's pretty plain, isn't it? We've got some choices to make, haven't we? I think I know what choice I want to make. I think I'd rather be a sheep. And if you're going to be a sheep, then you are going to set yourself to hearken to the voice of God and the shepherd and labour until your fingers are worn down to the bone for the spiritual welfare of your fellow sheep. That's what you'll do. And you won't allow goat characteristics which are natural to our nature to intrude. Now I want to finish in 1 Corinthians 4 which we read. Paul was accused of improper motivation. Let a man, he says in verse 1, so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, which is what he was. And notice this word, stewards. We've just been talking about stewardship, haven't we? It's going to be the key thing at the judgment seat. You're a faithful steward, whether you're male or female, young or old. Stewardship, your way of life, you're doing, are you there for someone else? You're there for yourself. Sheep are there for other people. Goats are there for themselves. But some in Corinth said, no, Paul, we know why you do this. You travel around from ecclesia to ecclesia because they give you money, all right? 
We don't know what you do with the money. You say you're going to give it to the Jerusalem poor fund. We don't know that. Show us the receipts, Paul. See, and they accused him of doing what he did for the wrong reason. You do this for self-aggrandizement, Paul. He says, verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, because they were judging him, or of a man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. In other words, he's not going to even pass sentence on himself. He's not going to say, I'm in the kingdom. Because he goes on to say this, verse 4, For I know nothing, and that, the word by, you need to change that. The, the RSV correctly translates this word by, right, in verse 4, as against. He says, I know nothing against myself, yet I am not hereby justified, because I can deceive myself. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore, he says, judge nothing before the time. He's not talking, of course, about making the necessary judgments of life and ecclesial life. He's talking about making judgments of whether someone's worthy or unworthy of the kingdom. You can't. I can't do that. Paul couldn't do that. That's got to be left to the judge himself. But then he says this. Until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness... And we'll make manifest. Now there's our word. There's our word, fanaru. To make manifest what he calls the counsels of the hearts. And that word in the Greek, bule, means the will, the determination, the propensity, purpose, design or plan. And I think Weymouth's translation is brilliant. Because he translates the phrase this way. And he will disclose the motives. That's what will happen in the judgment seat. Disclose the motives. What is in the engine room of your life? Because it's going to be revealed. The hidden things of darkness will come out at the judgment seat to vindicate the righteousness of God. And if at the judgment seat it is found that we have a sheep-like character, that we have devoted ourselves to a narrow course that leads to the kingdom and we give ourselves for the benefit of other people as best we can within the limitations of our opportunities and our scope and our health. If it's found that we've done that, brothers and sisters and young people, we will be in the kingdom. Providing, of course, we've sought forgiveness for our failings. No question about that. We'll be in the kingdom because our motives will be revealed there as being as pure as they can be, given the nature we bear. What about those whose motivation is not right? It's a sad story. But Paul ends this, this verse by saying, And then shall every man have praise of God. You people at Corinth, some of you people at Corinth are saying, I'm going around, he says, I'm going around for self-aggrandizement. You think I'm looking for human praise. Well, Paul would have said what I would say, brothers and sisters. Human praise might titillate human pride for a few seconds. But it's empty and vain. There's only one praise that's worth having. The praise of God. And you'll get that when the great shepherd smiles at you. And waves you to his right.